What's going on, y'all? KM Best here, your favorite not 69th ranked Marvel Snapper, Lambi Series, as always, joining me for Combined We Are Eight Cubes, and we're going to be talking about the eight most important topics in Marvel Snap, starting with Red Guardian. Now, Red Guardian is the card that is coming out on Tuesday, you know, God willing, right? As long as they don't mess up the <laughs> token shop or the uh, spotlight caches again. Uh, Red Guardian will be coming out on Tuesday. He is a 3-3 with the ability to have give your opponent's weakest card in a lane negative two power and remove its text, a silence ability, kind of like Spellbreaker in Hearthstone. Okay. Lambi, what do you think? Yeah, so Red, Red Guardian to me is actually an interesting card because like I, I don't really know what to feel about it because I want it to be good. I like this, I like this kind of cards like... Oh, you play a mid-range card and then you can invalidate your opponent's uh card effect. And it's a, like it's like a three-five, right? Because you go minus two on your opponent's card. But I I, I my, my biggest question is because it does it on the lowest cost card. I'm trying to figure out if it will be like because you know, you know, you you kind of want to play it on curve if it's in your hand. But like if you play it on curve if it's in your hand, is it actually removing the effect of something relevant? And if it's not, then is it actually good enough to run just as a three-five? Like, I think the first thing that comes to mind that I think should be quite good is, like, it can, like, invalidate Angela, right? Angela is popular right now. And, like, they play Angela on 2, you Red Guardian on 3. Angela becomes the 2-0 useless card, you get a 3-5. That sounds pretty good, but, like, is there any other kind of cards that you might want to, like, you know, just... Maybe maybe Red Guardian can be one of those cards like that, that you literally just slam onto the board and invalidate anything early and it doesn't really matter. Of course, like, you can top deck it late and I guess if the lowest cost card in your opponent's lane is like a Iron Man in a Tribunal deck, that's kind of nice. Lowest power. Yeah, lowest power, yeah. That, that, that's kind of yeah. ni that's kind of nice, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit interested to see like where this goes. I want it to be good though, for what it's worth. I want it to be good. What do you think? It seems like the kind of card that should be good. And it also seems like the kind of card where it's like, if it is good, it does a lot to sort of counterbalance things like Angela or Werewolf by Night, like the type of early scalers that we saw being dominant. And I wonder if that's a good thing right now, because I think everyone agrees that Angela coming back into the metagame was like a breath of fresh air. It's been really, you know, it's, it's been a good thing. We've had, you know, instead of Thanos running around, the dominant mid range -y point slam decks have been like these interactive Angela ones. They're a lot easier to beat. It has resulted in a lot of combo decks that can beat that. Like there is that, but it's like, you know, I kind of wonder, this does feel like a mid range tool where it's like, this goes against mid range decks. It doesn't seem like it, it's super impactful against decks like Mr. Negative against decks like Hella. It could hit a Dracula against Hella. That's cool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't seem like it's the most impactful card in the world against that. It feels like a tech card against the dominant style of mid-range decks. And that sort of makes me wonder because it's like, do we even need that? I'd imagine it's good in those mirrors, but it's like, does the metagame even need that? I feel like the biggest problem those decks have is losing the combo, not losing the mirrors. And I think that's just an interesting kind of card. I think Angela is a great shout, but I think the real thing that's going to determine how good Red Guardian is, is I think priority this is a priority card because when you have priority you know exactly what it's going to hit the other stuff is face down when you don't have priority your opponent can protect it this feels like a priority based three drop right where like making sure you have priority to hit that angela so your opponent doesn't play you know a two power kitty pride in that lane or like a kitty and a jeff and then suddenly it can't get hit by the red guardian that that kind of stuff i think is really interesting the fact that this like doesn't read as a priority card but I'm fairly certain having priority is going to be very important for this card being good. Yeah, it's like you can get to choose exactly what you want to hit with, with this card, right? Like, I, now that I think about it, like, even if you hit something like a Jeff, it's actually going to be quite impactful because it, it just can't move. And then you get a 3-5. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I, th I think very importantly, it's like a like 3-3 three, three and then minus 2, right? Like, the, the fact that it's actually a 3-5 value of stats makes it so, like, it's more okay to just play it against whatever. And yeah, I do yeah. agree. It's uh, it's definitely more like a mid-range card. Now, you probably don't have space to play this in your combo decks. It's already too tight. Yeah. Yeah, like, this is a card for a mid-range deck that's like, you know what I want to do is beat some other mid-range decks, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I want? I'd like to do that. I'd like to, like, I don't know. Can you play it in Loki to turn off opposing Mobius? Maybe. <laughs> like, that might be a thing you could do, right? But, I mean, more likely you're going to be getting it as Loki off of your Loki, and then you'll be like, aha, I'm, I'm just playing this as a 3-5, right? That kind of stuff. I think this just does feel like a card that is a mid-range card. Uh, a card that mid-range decks will play to beat other mid-range decks. 
Speaking of mid-range, I think it's become clear that, like, while Silky Smooth is sort of the default mid-range deck, there's, like, a million different variations on it, uh, ranging from, you know, just cutting the move stuff to playing Loki, or ranging from, you know, Sandman Leader to beat other mid-range decks, going for Jean Grey stuff in attempts to limit your opponent's combo deck plays. There's a lot of different ways to approach mid-range in this metagame, and generally they tend to be aimed in two directions. One is aimed at the mid-range pseudo-mirror, and the other is aimed at trying to beat combo decks. Which direction are you currently attempting to take your mid-range decks, Lambie? So the sad truth is that uh, I am a very big fan of like this mid-range style of deck, style of deck, like the whole silky smooth kind of stuff. But like from my personal experience, I feel like I am still very in the camp of just using a mid my mid-range deck to beat other mid-range decks. Because when I try to beat the combo decks with my mid-range deck, I feel like I'm just falling short very easily, right? Like it's very difficult to fit enough like tech plus points to outscale like the high rolls of a combo deck. And then if you fit all this tech into your deck, you just become worse versus the decks that don't care and just want to play points, aka your other mid-range deck. So, like, I, I've decided that, like, I'm just going to play mid-range to beat other mid-range, and if I queue into combo decks, I hope locations help me out. But, like, honestly, I, I, I don't think it's very feasible to try, and like, even, like, Cosmo. Okay, let's talk about Cosmo specifically, right? Like, Cosmo is something that you can fit in a mid-range deck to, to beat the other combo decks. But and then again, if you do not snipe a Hela, Hela's gonna run you over straight up. If you, let's just say, don't have it on Curve versus Phoenix Force, it's still gonna blow you out. And then of course, like, versus Tribunal stuff, Cosmo doesn't really do much versus Tribunal. In fact, they would be very happy to see the Cosmo in their location because they know that they can't get Enchantress. So like, yeah, I think I think it's very difficult to build mid-range to beat, like, um, um combo right now. I, I, did, I did flirt a bit with the idea of Eliyoth. Um, Eliyoth does do work versus the combo decks that, like, you know, all stack in one lane, aka Tribunal. But other than that, uh, it's, it's a big cope, I feel. So yeah, my camp is just, uh, if I want to play Silky Smooth, I'm going to play Silky Smooth the way it is, and then beat up the other decks, and maybe lose a bit to the combo decks. And a lot of that is about snap discipline, right? Yes. Where it's just like, when one of these combo decks snaps you, you're just like, I'm out. When yep. one of these combo decks doesn't snap you, and you're still going to lose on turn six, you're just like, I'm out. And, like, that kind of discipline in your bad matchups is basically required when you play a deck like this, Where because what you're saying, effectively queuing up Silky Smooth or Loki or whatever, you're saying, I'm trying to win the mirrors against other Angela decks. I'm probably not going to beat any combo deck ever. So, speaking of the combo decks, it's just the Wild West out here. Mr. Negative has been rising up recently as the, the like, I, I don't know a better way to put this than to say the mid-range of combo. <laughs> like, so it's, uh... It's the mid range of combo where you like are you yes you are doing like Jane negative but also you're playing like you know Shang Chi. There's worlds where after a Mister Negative you're doing stuff like Shang Chi Arnim Zola. Like there like it's not you know the greatest thing that's ever happened, but it is like the mid range of combo in that it feels like playing actual Marvel Snap as opposed to feeling like playing say Hella or Phoenix Force. Those those are very discrete experiences from typical Marvel Snap games. Mr. Negative is for the people who want to still feel like they're playing Marvel Snap, but also don't want to instantly lose to those combo decks. And yes, due to the point output it has, it can very easily take on a deck like Hela, a deck like Phoenix Force, and come out on top just in terms of the numbers it's putting on the board. So I think right now, if I had to recommend a combo deck, that would be the one I would recommend. What about you? So Phoenix... Uh, sorry, not Phoenix Force. That's something I'll talk about later. But uh, Mr. Negative is... Uh... Very interesting because like it it's a combo deck that people started playing because it actually goes taller than other combo decks, right? Like you go 05 Iron Man, 03 Mystiques, Shang and then Zola now, like this kind of stuff. It's like it's meant to do wombo combo things that go bigger than other wombo combo decks. But it's also actually inherently like more consistent and more like like hurt by a lot of the other like counters, which is like uh, you right. get hurt by Mobius, you get hurt by the Sandman that comes down on five, you get hurt by low rolls, which it's very often Sandman low rolls more than like other combo decks. Um, I, I actually want to play like my, my personal choice right now is I think I would play Phoenix Force, but not not the not the um Nimrod one. I would play the okay, so I would play the hard mode Phoenix Force, the one with all the movement stuff, Deadpool, uh, uh Taskmaster. Not because it's just strictly better, but I feel like if I were to play in a combo deck meta, I would really 
really want some interactivity, which is what we'll talk about next. And I feel like that version of the deck has a lot of interactivity and a lot of like different scenarios where you can play. Like the Phoenix Force Nimrod one is a bit too... Not wrong, but a bit linear for my taste, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a linear deck. And I think when Phoenix Force Nimrod was at its best, that was sort of before all these other combo decks got reintroduced to the meta. Because, like, when you think about combo versus combo matchups, they're very sandcastle-y, right? Who builds the bigger sandcastle is usually the person who wins because these decks mostly don't play interactive tools. Right. And Phoenix Force has the sort of, uh, you know, it has the rough profile of a Mr. Negative with its base plan. Like, the Phoenix Force plan happens about as much as a Mr. Negative Jane happens, right? Like, it's it's a little less, a little less likely, but it's in that ballpark, right? And then you have, on the other hand, something like Hella, which is just hyper consistent. That will happen a lot of the time. It is very hard to interact with. It just goes off and it does what it does. And that kind of stuff, like that kind of dynamic, it feels like all these combo decks exist on a spectrum from like reliable to point ceiling. And every time you go up on that spectrum, you sacrifice a little bit of reliability for more ability to like instantly win for free in term in a matchup against someone who is not playing interaction. And that's just a very odd metagame dynamic that I think we'll sort of dive into a little bit more later. But I will say that the constant presence of combo decks trying to like out big number each other and like metagaming against each other has been an interesting one is how I'll put it. Agreed. So I guess let's talk about interactivity, right? Because it feels like combo decks exist on a spectrum of you can't interact with me and I'm probably bigger than a mid-range deck to you can definitely interact with me and I'm definitely bigger than a mid-range deck. Where on the one side of the spectrum, there is Hella, which is you can't interact with me. I'm probably bigger than you, but I'm not guaranteeing it. And on the other side of the spectrum, Living Tribunal, way bigger than you. Uh, Mr. Negative, when it works, way bigger than you. Like, these are decks that are just going to go way, 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 way bigger than you. Phoenix Force, I think, exists closer to that side of the spectrum. Uh, I would say that it ends up in... It, it, it has, like, a relatively lower point output, but it has multiple plans and that kind of thing. It is able to be interacted with, but not by cards that are typically being played. Where are you at with this impact on the metagame these combo decks are having? Yeah, so this is going to be a very different opinion from what I usually have. Um, so generally, I'm someone that like, if I get to play the best deck, I want to play the best deck. Like, I, I just want to play the best deck and win the games, right? But like, I've started to feel like this, a lot of the good combo decks right now, set Truth, I actually don't enjoy. Like, it's, it's, it's very rare for me to say this, but I actually don't enjoy this combo-ish meta that much because the interactivity between each other is like super low. Right, like the bet. The funny thing is, the better combo decks are the ones that interact the least. Like Hella, I feel like Hella is just one of the best like combo things you can do now. Cause like it's like it's weird to say, but it's actually more consistent than other combo decks, right? Like it's it does the same thing, and then it just throws out big stuff, low effort. It's very simplistic, very everybody can do, and very difficult to interact and beat. And I don't really enjoy that personally because like you don't have much control of any situation whether you're playing it or against it. So, like, I mentioned a lot about Phoenix Force, like, in the previous topic and also this one, because I I think I'm going to be that guy for the first time in a long time. I'm going to be that guy that plays the lesser deck, like, yeah. and maybe maybe for my streams or whatever. Because, like, I it's like I don't think I can enjoy playing that much Hella, and I'd rather be the underdog, which is not something that I usually do. I'd rather be the underdog and play some, like, complex wombo combo phoenix force whereby i have a bit more interaction and like free play in like what i can do with like locations and my opponent's deck then like to just play a hella that just plays covers on three then don't discard hella snap and then like that's the end of it right so like i feel uh this is that one time whereby i'm a bit like upset that i cannot play my best deck because i mean i can play the best deck but i wouldn't really enjoy the best deck so i might gravitate towards playing a lesser deck for the first time in a long time yeah, I think of all these combo decks, the one that strikes me as the most genuinely problematic is Hella, and it's not a power level thing. It's just like when you look at all these other decks, Living Tribunal, Mr. Negative, Phoenix Force, 
I can put a card in my deck to deal with that. It might not deal with it perfectly. It might not deal with it in every situation. It might not make it a completely unplayable. It might not make it, you know, a good matchup for me, but it'll make it better, right? I can I can do something about that in deck building, right? There's not a card in the game I can put in my deck and be like, this appreciably makes my Hella matchup better. Yep. People are going to say like Cosmo or Eliath, and that's cope, right? Like, uh, I don't think it appreciably makes your Hella matchup better to have a 33% chance to win those games because what's happening is you're going to stay in on 33 percenters and lose them most of the time. And like that actually does not improve your matchup. That just actually kind of makes it worse. Yes. Like that's arguably making your deck worse in the matchup you're trying to improve. There's no Mobius for do what Hella does. And I think the issue with Hella is not one that can really be solved in terms of her own card. She's going to be this uninteractive combo deck until they make a card that isn't that, right? Like, that is Mobius for Hella, right? I don't know what that looks like, but it's the kind of thing where it's like, that does not seem like the kind of thing you can fix on the card Hella. I see a lot of proposals that are like, all right, what if we made it so Hella only brought stuff back in her own location? And it's like, well, that just makes her terrible. That makes her totally, completely unplayable. She only does one thing now. And it's like, that, I, it would solve the balance issue, but it wouldn't solve, like, you know, this card is unappealing, right? Like it wouldn't, it would basically just be like solving the balance issue by deleting her entirely is sort of how that would go down. I feel like, and I that, think if that becomes mm. the, if that becomes the actual effect of Hela, then people are just going to play like, uh, play her like, like pre enough blob, right? Because if she realizes everything mm -hmm. in one location, she solos the location straight up. So yeah. it's just going to be another Professor X, like Professor X one lane, Hela everything in one location <laughs> or something. Yeah, It's going to be like that. Like I feel, I feel like, yeah, that's definitely not the way to solve the card. Uh, oh, hell yeah. No, that's actually so good. You go like Corvus, Prop X on four. Oh uh, yeah. And then you Hela for sure because it's like literally 40 power blob all over again. Everyone will love that. Like it, it's the kind of gameplay that everyone has already proven to hate, and it, like the it, it it really goes to show just how like annoying it is to have this uninteractive thing in the meta that people are like, you know what we should do is make it blob. <laughs> That's tough. Yeah. So I guess in reaction to that last point, how do you as a player deal with metagames like this where the dynamics are not what you would want? They're not the thing you enjoy. I, it, obviously, like, you know, I know there's going to be people out there who are like, I love this. The dynamics are what I want. And uh, in that case, you know, more power to you. I hope you enjoy your combo next. I really have no, like I want to be super clear on this because it has come up before. I have no animus towards anyone choosing to play these decks. It is not. Yeah your problem <laughs> like uh, i i highly encourage you to play the best deck you possibly can and beat up all the whiners like me 100 percent. highly encourage it um just in terms of talking about what i enjoy i can't get away from that right so in just like to be clear if you're a hella gamer salute keep doing it it's not your fault that i don't like this and it's not your fault for playing a good deck uh I, the fault lies on the people who made the card and all that stuff right it's not anyone who's playing the deck's fault uh how do you deal like is it just the snap discipline thing is that just the most important thing in metas like this you just gotta like just accept it and be like yep it's gonna happen and i have to just live with it yeah so generally a lot of how i deal with any like competitive meta where there's like one or two best decks is it's really a player diff thing and i think i think i think i can ex i can use this example to explain the player diff thing because like you, re you really need to understand the matchup right which is very weird to say like to understand the hella matchup which is who high who does not discard their hella who gets the covers on turn three and like you mentioned it's in such metas whereby the variance is higher and the skill ceiling is lower it just means that even the less experienced or casual players will be able to do the same thing as the more experienced and the more like um like, like invested players, right? So in this kind of metas, I feel like the most important thing is you need to firstly understand to deal is to know that you will lose more. If you are an experienced player, you will know, you know you will lose more because your age is less. And so once you accept that, then you go to the next point, which is your snap discipline, right? Which is like, if you are if you know that um, there are certain scenarios that you always lose to, which is like they have covers, they didn't discard Hella, uh, well, then you leave. So I feel like it's 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 a lot about discipline, 
when the variance is high and when the skill age is low and there's less things that you can do to squeak out a win of out of like random situations because it's just like it's just like the writings on the wall right there's certain situations it's just the writings on the wall i feel like it's just like good to accept that you cannot win and just go next like it's gonna happen a lot especially if the meta stays the way it is right now because the mid-range decks like we mentioned in the first or second topic that we be it, they can't keep up too easily with the wombo combo stuff so you do expect a lot of wombo combo stuff and to deal with these wombo combo things is to accept that you don't always beat it and then like identify that um in situations where they don't have the good stuff, like if they play covers and discard Hela, you snap them. If they don't play covers, you snap them. Or if they don't play, I don't know, Iron Man on 5 in the Tribunal deck, maybe you snap them. Like you do stuff like this and you cope a bit. Like it's going to sound very weird, but I feel like being able to cope a little bit is also very important in beating these matchups because like any opportunity you have where they don't do the perfect thing to destroy you, you should take, snap, see where it goes. If they eventually have it, you probably should retreat. But these are some things you can do to like, like tie through this meta that has a lot less interactivity. And I feel like if you can change that mindset and accept that mindset for yourself, your games will be a bit more enjoyable because you're accept accepting that it's like uh, a bit given that you cannot win certain of the times. And if you can accept that, then it probably will be a bit more of an enjoyable experience. That was phenomenal advice. That might be like the best huh. segment we've had on this show. I'm not even joking. That was really good. That came from somewhere deep here, which I do not know where it, it came from. Hearthstone. You brought yeah, through I this actually, before? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, yes. I was like, where did that come from? And I was like, oh, yeah. No, I know where that came from. That came from Mind Render Alusha. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that came from a career driven by variants. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I, I've entered a save me white girl mode. <laughs> which is like I need I need White Widow to show up and save me. Like I I would like White Widow to like just add some clog elements to every deck in the game. If you just play like White Widow debris, I feel like that's actually just really good into like half the combo decks in the meta. Where you're just like if you're just like clogging up a Hella deck. I've been playing a lot with like various types of clog decks. Usually I think the Professor X ones are better into Hella, but like, just being able to clog stuff puts you in a good position against things like Living Tribunal because they need those four spots in a lane. Puts you in a reasonable spot against Mr. Negative. Again, Negative is a deck that scales very heavily off the card Iron Man and tends to, right now, at least also be doing, like, a bunch of Arnim Zola stuff. Clog, 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 right? But what clog is missing is just good cards. Yes. Like, that's the fundamental issue that the deck has right now. There's just not enough good cards in it. There's some pretty solid ones. Like, the deck is... I was shocked when I played it. Like, I was like, oh, man, this deck is, like, really almost real. And I kind of wonder if White Widow might actually show up and be like, this is the answer. You're welcome. We can deal with this now. I really do wonder if, like, the, like we talked about how, like, there's, like, mid-range decks and there's combo decks and there's not really, like, a third archetype of deck right now. And that's it's weird, and I don't know if that's good. It's possible that attacking the board as a method of dealing with both of these decks could create that sort of third point in the triangle of the metagame. And I'm, I'm like, save me, white girl. I really, I need her to show up and save me. I need this to be right. Yeah, so actually, I, I really like this, like, 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 topic and this point about the whole, okay, not really, not, not so much about the save me, white girl thing, but I just realized... You're okay, fine, that's just me, fine. <laughs> okay. okay, I get it. No, 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 but I, I realized something which is... uh. Yeah, you know, you know, clock doesn't really have best in slots. Like if you think about it, like like yes, clock doesn't have best. I feel like clock needs best in slots. Like okay, the best in slot clock is, clock card is like maybe like hood annihilator sentry or whatever. But like there there hasn't been like a best in slot two, best in slot four, best in slot three, right? Because like for this card, uh, such a niche archetype, best in slot two, Mobius, best in slot four, um, um Dracula, you know, Modok. Yeah, that that archetype has that, and that's why it slowly gravitated towards being a tier one deck like last month. I feel like if clock has has best in slots like the deck building can be a bit more streamlined and when you streamline it like i think cannonball is one of the things that got it a bit closer right now cannonball yes. is the best in slot five I, I guess but like yeah so once i think we get more of those for clock it can become a real archetype because like you said actual good cards that people will want to play regardless make up the clock archetype you know now it's like you need to force a clock archetype together with like one or two just good cards the rest are just like filler and i feel like with white widow coming out we might be getting closer to that yeah, like, one thing that really sticks in my mind is her exact cost. Like, one of the plays that Clog has that's pretty strong is Titania Green Goblin on 4, right? 
on five now, you have White Widow Green Goblin, which has basically no downside. Mm -hmm. You have uh, White Widow Debris, right? Like, the, these are car these are things that can win you a lane on turn five and the game is just over it is done you have won that lane and you have cannonball and it's done and that kind of thing like white widow is not just good because she's a two six in the early game that forces your opponent to play stuff she's good because she's effectively a goblin with no downside on turn five you can play a clog card and her and if they both go off, they're full clogged. If they play one card there, it's also fine. Like it is that specific dynamic I see having some some really interesting impacts on this game. I want to talk about something I've been seeing that's just been weirding me the hell out. And it is just like otherwise normal mid range decks just like playing a magic. What's going on here? What is this? Why are people doing this? And do you think it's a good idea? OK, so th this topic. I'm a bit not so like sure to be frank because I don't see it as much as I think you do. It's just a thing where it's just like I'll be like like you'll just be playing like your normal little mid range deck, doing like a mid range thing, and like 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 Den posted a bit uh, uh, a deck on Twitter that was like you know it's bounce right, it has magic in it, and it's like wait what's going on? Why is there a magic here? And uh, like Ava was playing a. Uh, like a U.S. Agent Man thing deck, and it just had a magic in it, and it's like, what? What is this? Why is this? Like, okay, 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 I get it, I get it. So I, I don't. Okay, so I don't get the part about why it might be good, but I get the part of why it's seeing more play. It's a lot of a lot okay. of it has to do with like the downswing of like like Thanos being a thing. Like, I feel like a lot of the reason outside of like the Alliance of Nerf that combo decks are rising up right now also, right? It's because there's no good turn for Professor X deck, right? Thanos was the premier turn for Professor X deck and like it's not possible right now with any other deck, I would say reliably. So, so and, and one more thing that Thanos brought away with it when he went down was Reality Stone is a one cost Scarlet Witch that draws a card. It's gone. Okay, not gone. It's like less seen, right? So I feel like magic songs just go up a little bit simply because of that. But personally, I, I, I'm just gonna that I don't see why people are doing okay. like magic mid range. Like I, I think mid range yeah. just want to end the game before people go crazy with their combos. That's, why That's typically how I think about it too. But like, what if it's the other way? What if they're like, okay, <clears throat> okay, they're what if they're doing the same thing you're doing, where you're like, I always lose to the combo deck anyway, so I'm going to play to be the combo deck in mid range matchups. Where it's like I need the time to get my like my like small combo, not like a game winning combo, but like a synergy combo, like Luke Cage U.S. Agent or whatever, right? Okay. Like I, I need the time to do that. I need the time to make sure I set up my small combo, and that way I'll beat the mid range mirrors, and I'm always just losing to Hella or whatever, so I don't even really care, right? I'm just always dead, so I can just play magic. Does that make sense, or is that? is something that I cannot answer. I'm actually quite stumped because I never once okay. considered magic to be something I would want to play in my mid-range deck. Because in my mid-range deck, I just want yeah. to play slats. I want to end the game by turn six with my super duper big Red Hulk. I don't want to see an extra turn. I don't want to give you an extra turn. But if there is something unexplored that I don't see, because I don't, please tell me because I really don't. Yeah, same, same to me. <laughs> Let me know in the comments. When we were coming up with topics for this, Lambi was like, I feel very strongly about this. And I want to talk about it. And he actually was like, I'm not sure you, you're you going to want to have this on your channel. I generally have an approach of if one of us feels strongly about something, it just goes on it. So, Lambie, you feel strongly about Thanos. And the background for this is uh, their number one player on ladder is crazy. Uh, he's playing Thanos. And he's really good and could probably do that with a ham sandwich. And Lambie <laughs> has things to say. Right, so I, I need to debunk something first because firstly, I don't understand something and I, I want to hope, I want to know why you guys maybe don't understand it or so, which is like, oh, understand <laughs> it or something. But like, okay, so I am the Thanos guy. I started my Marvel Snap streaming career with Thanos. But like now, I'm literally telling you that Thanos is not that good. Why? Okay, let me list facts first, okay? So you've already known this, but if you don't know, let me list facts again. So 18 card deck, right? Naturally more inconsistent. Unplayable quick Quicksilver starting in your hand, which makes the deck like brick more, right? You draw less stones. You are, by drawing less stones means you get through your deck slower. You're mocking the bird comes down later. You don't even get to draw like 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 through your deck as often because you have one unplayable card in your hand hundred percent of the time, which is like 
super inconsistent in a card game. And this deck is already like larger than other decks. So everything about Thanos is just like going against it right now. Like every single fundamental, every single like Thanos can work out thing is not working out. Like every single thing that Thanos has going for it is not going for it right now. So people may still think that Thanos is good because someone hit rank one with Thanos, but I would like to debunk this because from personal experience, I competed on the ladder for like what three or four months before I stopped. Um, this person that hit rank one, uh, very good player. They are always in top ten, by the way. They are yeah. in top ten every month without fail with any deck at one point in time. So, if your reference to because I see this a lot in my Twitch chat, oh uh, yo, let me Thanos is still good. Uh, someone hit rank one a bit. Let me just debunk this for you. Like KM said, maybe not a ham sandwich, but maybe a Something sandwich. Maybe like a pastrami on rye. Yeah, yeah. They could hit rank one with a fruit, an apple, <laughs> or something. Because if you are good at this game, you will be on the top of the leaderboard. So I, I, I really want to just say that I am very sure Thanos is not meant to be consistently good, right? Like if you draw Mindstone in three out of your 10 games and be like, oh, I, I'm still drawing Mindstone, play 100 games and tell me if you draw Mindstone that consistently. Like honestly, honestly, like, like I, I don't want to keep going on like a broken book, but like I need to... I, I want to cut in. I really do. Okay. okay go, go. I, I'm going to provide the counterpoint. Like, okay. yes, I don't think Thanos is really good. Okay. But... As probably the only other person on the planet who was playing Corvus Thanos before the nerf, okay. like, it's not that far off, right? It's not what it was. Yes, it's not what it was, right? I get it. Sure, it's not what it was. But being like the, the one advantage Corvus Thanos has after the nerf is it's the only deck that you can build Thanos, to, like you, the only build of Thanos that actually takes advantage of the fact that he starts in your opening hand. It's the oh, only shit. one. Eh, not and, wrong and like I, I not wrong or wrong not not wrong but you still need okay. to draw the corvus no yeah yeah there's still more right you still need to draw the corvus you still need to do that stuff but it's like i do appreciate that deck building twist i really do i think it's like you know i do i think it makes thanos great again probably not do i think that thanos is in the like top tier of elite decks again probably not is it worth mentioning I, like you see it every so often and it's usually like kind of an easy out if you're not playing against literally crazy like it's um i don't know but what i will say is as a previous corvus thanos player i really appreciate it and yeah. as a someone who appreciates nice deck building twists i like what it's thinking i really do like do i think thanos is i I think Thanos is probably pretty okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm higher on it than you are. I think that build of Thanos is probably pretty solid. It's uh, more a question of like what kind of player you are. Do I think it's the best deck in the game? No. No, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I think all I can say to that is that like I... Maybe because I personally feel very strongly about Thanos and when it was good, I loved it. When it was average, I loved it. And then now they did like what they did to yeah. Thanos now. I feel like it's so... It, it hurts so badly. The deck, the, the deck's like so much worse right now and I feel like trying to make it good has made me feel like why? Like why? Right. Yeah, like why don't Is we it just copium a little bit? Sure, right? Like yeah. it might be. But like I, I think that it, it deserves legitimate commendation because okay. what you're effectively saying is... This guy's really damn good, yes. right? And that is absolutely true. He is really damn good. Uh, I think that the real thing, though, is like the deck is not that bad, right? Like the way you're talking about it, you're talking about it like it's like, oh, this is awful. It's not good. It's not great, I would say. But it's like a solid, reasonable deck that rewards player skill. It's an actual deck. And I think of all the decks in Marvel Snap right now, it's the one that, you know, has more of a relatively even matchup spread between mid-range and combo. It's right. not polarized. And now, whether or not, you know, it's, you know, I think you could reasonably look at me and say, you know, KM, okay, yeah, of course it has a relatively more even matchup spread. It's 45% into both of them. Like, you could, you could say that, right? But 
I think there is an argument for a deck that has that matchup spread. I think there is an argument for a deck that has that matchup spread and a massive amount of player skill in it. And I think that this is not an accident that someone who is extremely talented at the game is doing what he's doing with the deck. Do I think that you, average Joe player, should pick up Thanos and play it? No, God, no. I don't, I don't recommend you play the deck. But I think that at the very highest level, I really do get it, actually. I really do understand the drive to find that deck that matches up well and lets you express your skill and has the ability to play evenly into basically anything you see. I, I get the appeal. I really do. And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. I recently received a question as to why we don't put this on podcast platforms anymore. And unfortunately, the answer is I, I do my own editing. You can tell because it sucks. Uh, Lamby has an editor. And that means that what happens is there's like an off tempo release schedule for the second episode. And so I've thought about like, you know, I, I don't really want to like make his editor send an audio version to me. Then I upload it waiting 12 hours so I don't steal his views like a whole. It was kind of like a whole thing. Uh, I might just start uploading like my half of the show to Spotify or something. If we could figure that out, I don't really know. Just let me know in the comments what you'd want us to do with regards to podcast platforms, because I've gotten some questions about that lately. And I just wanted to like sort of explain what was going on with that. Uh, basically, it felt like there was no real fair way to do it. That was fair to Lambie in, 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 in terms of like getting this stuff up on podcast platforms in a way that wasn't uh interfering with his uh potential youtube numbers and uh that was that was sort of my thought process towards it where it was just like that just didn't seem like a thing that was reasonable it would be asking for more work from him because he has his own editor do this it would be asking for more work in terms of scheduling this stuff out so let me know in the comments what you'll think and lambie take us out all right thank you so much for being here with us in this uh episode it might be a bit more heavy this one but i think the topics will be very like well received good to discuss and so with that i just want to say thank you so much for being here we will see you guys in the next one goodbye <laughs>